Okay, so today, uh, basically, what I'll tell you um, is more about this stuff about work. Um, when is a vector field conservative? Uh, what do you get by knowing that? Okay, let's see. Okay, so last time, what I was telling you. If you have a curve, <laughs> let's say you have a curve connecting two points P and Q, and again, like you can think if you like that you're like kind of dragging an object along this curve. Um, and so you have like a, and then there's a vector along this curve as well, which uh, is convenient to think of it as some sort of force that's being applied to that object that's being moved along the curve. So I'm just drawing a bunch of arrows to try to indicate that there's kind of like a force like, like acting upon the object, okay? The important thing here is just to kind of emphasize uh, it can like it's not like a constant force necessarily. It is allowed to change, so it can change in direction. It can change uh, in magnitude as well. And under those circumstances, uh, the definition of work that I gave you, the work done by F along the curve. It's just, uh, I mean, like in terms of um, computations, you can compute it as a dot product between the force and the velocity vector of the curve, um, dt. Where here, like maybe you think of this point as being uh, the position at times uh, time zero, and this point as being the position at time one. Um, let's call it tf for final and ti for initial. So this think of it as like uh, the initial position and the final position along the curve. Uh, so this would be like an integral from ti to tf. Okay, and here b is just the r dt. Okay. Uh, then uh, the idea is that if, you know, if you think about like the curve connecting the points p and q, and you had chosen a different curve connecting these two points, like it could have been like a straight line or like something more like a spiral thing. Like, you know, there are infinitely many curves actually connecting these two points. Uh, then you could also like, it, you could compute the work along those different curves. And in general, like what you would find is that the work does depend on the curve that you choose, not just like the initial and final positions, right? Uh, so, the concept I ended up with last time was uh, this idea of like a conservative force or con conservative vector field that's like, uh, it's also called, so let's talk about those. So there are these conservative forces. which have like the special property that the work only depends on the endpoints. So the work does not depend on the curve, only the on the initial and final points. Okay, so work um, does not depend on the curve, only on the initial and final points. Okay, and uh, well, I still haven't shown you how to find those examples because it's not clear right now whether there's like a force with that property. Like it's like a very special property. So like, obviously there will be some because otherwise I wouldn't have told you about this, but like, you know, if you just hear this like idea, 
at first, like it may not be super obvious why would this be uh, true, right? That there would be uh, forces with this property. So what I'll, what we will discuss today is kind of how do you identify those forces? So what are the, what are the uh, conditions that they must satisfy? So here's an example, and this is kind of like the what basic way to construct these uh, conservative forces. So, so the question is, are there conservative forces? And the uh, here's like a very simple recipe to produce some. Uh, so the answer is yes. Here's one way to do this. Uh, take your favorite function of three variables. Uh, take a function of three variables. Well, just to write some examples, uh, it could be something. It could be x plus y plus z squared. It could be something even simpler than that, like, um, no, just three C. Like it doesn't need to depend on all the variables. Like it is allowed to depend on the three variables, but it could just depend on one of them. Uh, something like e to the x y plus z. I mean, you can imagine just write, start writing a bunch of different formulas. So, like, take any of these, and uh, once you have a function, there is a way to construct a vector out of a function, uh, which is the gradient. Okay, so my claim define the state F, the vector F, the force to be the gradient of this function. That I'm going to claim that that is going to be a conservative force. So this will be a conservative force. Uh, why is it? Oh, so in these examples, right, in, in the examples that I just gave you, so in the previous examples, before like explaining why this works, what is the first gradient? The first gradient is uh, one, one, two, z. What is the second gradient? The second gradient is Zero, zero, three. What is the third gradient? Okay, that one is a little bit more annoying. Is okay. those like the like those are the corresponding gradients for those uh, three functions that I wrote there. Let me put some arrows here. Okay, so uh, what I'm saying is that any of these. Three back, those are three vector fields or three vectors. Any of these three have the property that the work done by these vectors, by these forces, only depends on the initial and final positions of the curve, not on the actual curve that you choose. Yeah. Which, like, if you just like, if you can just start in with these vectors, you know, it is not super clear right now how would you determine that, right? Like, you just look at them and they don't necessarily have many things in common, right? Like, so, uh, what we have to kind of like discuss today is like, what is the thing that they all have in common that would allow you to say that? But um, like this one is, uh, you know, um, this one is closer to like the constant gravitational potential field, right? Because it's just like a vector that's like uh, constant uh, in the z direction. But like the other 
like this first one and the third one, like maybe very like I mean, there's there's nothing like special about them in the sense that they don't even have like a particular uh, name. So why? Let me explain to you why is this going to be a conservative force? So I mean, why a, right? Why is it going to be a conservative force in the sense of the work only depending on the initial or final positions? Okay, so. The idea of being conservative is that the work uh, should only depend on the, on the influence of the curve. So let's try to do it for this one. Like, let's suppose you have this, this curve, you have the endpoints P and Q. So in general, So what is, what is the work done in this case? So again, the work is always the dot product between it's always the dot product between the force and the velocity vector. If the force happens to be a gradient, right? Then you can replace the force like the f, the uppercase f with the gradient of lowercase f. So the gradient of the function. So this would be the okay. So you are integrating the dot product between uh, the gradient and the vector v. Uh, where have we seen the dot product between the gradient and a uh, vector? It, it is, it was in the directional derivative uh, stop, right? Like in the, if you remember like the directional derivative uh, uh, of a function along a vector was the dot product between the gradient and the direction, right? Um, so it is worth like thinking about that for a second. What's going on here? And it's actually, I believe in your case, it's related to one of these midterm problems, like on the exam that, uh, which I did it for the temperature. If you remember, I think it was problem three or, uh, or something like that. But what's happening is like the function depends on x, y, and z, right? Uh, but then, uh, because you're moving along a curve, right? X, Y, and Z depend on T. It's the same with the temperature when I wrote the diagram, if you remember the exam problem. So, so like you can secretly think of F as depending on T and by the chain rule, uh, the, the, the derivative of F with respect to T is this thing. Yeah, that's actually the motivation that we had also for the directional derivative. So like th these are like basically the same idea. Okay. But if you look at this, like, yeah, this is just the dot product between the gradient and the RDT, the, the position vector of the curve, the, the derivative of the position vector of the curve. So, um, this is just the, the product between the gradient and the velocity vector. So what that means is that here, actually, you can replace this with the derivative of f with respect to t. OK, and now this is a the fundamental theorem of calculus, of calc 1. Like, that's just like the function evaluated at the endpoints of the interval. So it's just f of pf minus f of pi. What does this mean? Like means like the function at time tf, which is like f of q, like you know, like the function at this time is just like the final point minus the function at the initial time, which is like f of p. Well, but that just only depends on the endpoints, right? Like so, but this is saying is that the work is just the difference in the value of this function at the endpoints, which by the way, uh, this uh, disagrees from the physics convention by an overall sign. So I'll explain that in a second. Um, 
So what we're going to call this the potential function for F. It's just that our potential function for like a very silly reason that the mathematics and physics textbooks don't agree, despite having the pub, same publishers, like should like in mind of the potential fun, potential of the physicist. So, um, so, but what this is saying, what we just found, like this is great, like this only depends on Q and P, like the, like the integral disappeared, right? Like, and thanks to the fundamental theorem of calculus. So what this is saying is that when this happens, like, let me just rewrite it. So, so if F is the gradient of a function, then the work done by F is F of final point minus F of initial point. Uh, yeah. It's double set here. Mm -hmm. We have f of t, but then f of q doesn't q represent. F oh, so or are you taking this? Right. So I, I'm just abusing notation a little bit. What do I mean by f of t here? I mean the function at time t, right? But at time t, like you know, like the function strictly speaking was like a function of of x, y, and z. So I just mean like really like the same as the value of the function at this point. So like you can like if you want to write like an extra step just to like make the notation a bit a little bit better. I just meant here like uh, f of r of tf. Like really that's how like, a, you know, like the formula had to come out for this to like make more sense. But uh, but yeah, like the thing is like along the parametrization, you know, like along the parametrization, like oh. f becomes a function of time, like secretly. But so it just really means like, so it, like in practice, there's no ambiguity. Like once you do like a concrete example, yeah. uh, it's just um, because you just literally evaluate the the the, the potential, which what we will call the, the potential at those uh, at the endpoints. But yeah, it's just uh, really this this is what I mean by that. Uh, is that is that making sense? Yes. Uh, So this gives you like a great recipe of producing conservative forces. You start with your favorite function, take its gradient, and that's conservative. That's like, and that gives you tons of like examples, right? Um, So just to give you some, uh, like some like actual uh, cases that you know you would have seen before, like if you have taken like a physics class, here are some examples. Like if you take f x, you'll see that there's like a, a like an opposite sign from the things that you're used to uh, seeing, like in physics. So if you take Something like this, k okay, uh, k of constant. What is the gradient of this function? Well, it only depends on x, right? Um, then it gives you minus k x zero zero, right? And that's like the spring force, like in Kutsa, right? So, uh, and just like usually again, like in physics, like you would have this as plus one half of k x squared. So that's what I'm saying that I would f be first by a sign from like how the physicists would write it. So I'll explain that in a second. But here's another one. Like if you take f of x, y, z, like minus m, v, z, um, then the gradient of this function would be zero, zero minus m, g, right? Which is like just like, you know, like the regular gravitational force, like, like when you drop something like constant height. Again, like it's not like there's a minus sign that you probably don't recognize because again, like what we're calling F is what the physicists would call minus the potential. So like there's like this like uh, um, ambiguity there. And, uh, and one that's a little bit more tricky is like something like, well, 
something like this. Uh, this one does require some, you need to double check. I mean, in the sense of uh, it's not being like a super easy cut. I mean, it's not, a, not too bad to find a gradient here. Uh, it does require some, If you take something like that, uh, like yeah, like the gradient of this would be like okay. so this is like two to the minus one half. And Where in vector notation, if you call the position vector R, X, Y, Z, like a better way to write this is like that the gradient of this function is K, K times R over the norm of R. So this is like, it's like an inverse square law because this vector has unit length. And so this is kind of like, it depend, depending on how you call it K, that would be like the Coulomb law or the gravitational law. So this is the one over R squared, basically, like, you know, like the, the and, and this is like a unit vector, which is radial. So that's how you would get um, those examples. So all, like, these are kind of more like uh, basic, um, like potentials, like that's how they're called, that you may have seen before. So like, what because of what we said, like all of these forces are conservative, you know, like, um, so just to, some terminology, and, and I will add the remark that of that I have been discussing. Uh, we call F a potential function for big F. Well, uh, uh, potential function. For And in physics, um, really what they would call the potential is what minus F, so. The, their potential function is. Is uh, minus F. So like what I'm trying to say is like what I'm calling right now the potential, they would call minus the potential, like which is like a very unfortunate disagreement. But it, again, like you kind of have to teach it in the same way, like in which the, the textbook is written, but like, yeah, like it would be better. Like, so typically they would put like, they would write this as minus the gradient of a, of a, of a, of a function. And so that's how that would go, like, which is actually makes more sense. like. Uh, to do it in that convention, but since we're kind of stuck with this one for for now. Um, so far, so good. Questions about this? So again, if you start with your favorite function in the world, take its gradient that gives you a conservative force. Perfect. Uh, what's in like what's really interesting is that more or less the converse is true. So any conservative force is a gradient of some function. That's what makes this like a useful idea. So. We won't get into the proof of that uh, because that requires Stubbs theorem, which is the last theorem in the course. Uh, so it's kind of like, uh, um, you know, like if we get, once we get to Stubbs, I may just mention why that works, but like we're kind of going a, a bit backwards. So what's more interesting So like the important fact is that is that if F is uh, conservative, is a conservative factor or a conservative force, Uh, 
uh, then one can find a potential function for f. Then one, then you you say like it admits a potential function, so or but I'll just say one can find a function. Such that so that like so in terms of what is conservative, a conservative force, that is all there is. Like they are really just like the gradient of functions. Like uh, Okay, here's a conceptual question, important conceptual question because I I do like this one. So if you had a function of three variables and you set it equal to a constant, right? This is like one of the most important ideas also. So what happens? What again, second example. What occurs when you set a function of three variables equal to a constant? What did we call that? A level small well, level surface. Like it would be level curve if just two variables. So perfect. So let's just let me try to draw like some sort of like weird surface here. So let's say this is like f equals constant. So this is like a level surface, right? So uh, what was a vector perpendicular to a level surface? The gradient of the function, right? So a normal vector is the gradient of the function. But it, like in this context, you know, that would correspond to that force, right? Because the force is like, we're taking the force to be the gradient of the function. So that means that the force is perpendicular or orthogonal to the level surfaces, uh, which are called equipotential surfaces, like in the, the potential terminology. So this, instead of calling this a level surface, you call this like an equipotential surface. because it means all the points with the same potential, right? So, uh, so F is like a, a force or a vector perpendicular to the level surfaces, okay? So this is like a vector perpendicular to the level surfaces. And Here's another cool fact. What happens if you take, let's say that you take a point P and a point Q on the same level surface or the, on, the, on the same equipotential surface. Okay, so P and Q are, uh, belongs to the same level surface. So let me just write it here on the same level surface. Well, what would the work, take your favorite curve connecting these two points. Like for example, this one, it doesn't need to stay on the curve uh, surface. Yeah. It's gonna be zero. Right, right, like the point like, is that the network or, or the work is just zero because you're evaluating the function at the, at the point, at the end point, but they take the function takes the same value at the end point. So what would be the work here? The work would be F of, uh, Q minus F of P, right? But that's zero because F is the same at the, you know, F takes the same value at these two points because they're both points on the same level surface. Okay. So what that means is that if you take, like what that means is that the network, when you move something like, you know, from one point to the, like that's kind of, okay. Like in the voltage terminology, it's like if you, you have two points at the same uh, 
voltage, like or however this call, like then like when you the network uh is zero, like when you move like a charge. Um uh, okay, so that's very like a very interesting fact. Like Okay. Did did that make sense? Like is that clear? Uh and like, yeah, and more generally, what's the work done from taking a point from one level surface to another level surface is just like the difference in the values of those level surfaces like that, uh, you know. Uh, so now let me, so what I was saying so far is that uh, if you're conservative, you're the gradient of a function. So the question is like, is how do you determine if something is conservative, right? Uh, because one way to, would be to try to find like this function, which we'll do later, but you don't want to waste your time find, trying to find the function if there's no function to be found. So there is a criteria that you can check ahead of time to see whether you should spend your, your time trying to find a potential function. And that involves something called the curl of a vector, okay? So how do you determine, so here's like the important question, how do you determine if a uh, potential will exist? How do you determine if, um, if F is conservative? And again, um, it's kind of weird, but like to actually explain this, you really have to again do kind of like the end of the course first, which is like Stokes theorem. So like I won't, I'll just put it like some sort of black box, like tell you what the answer is. Um, you have to find the curl of f. So you you compute the curl of f, which I'll tell you what it is in a second. You must find the curl of f. Like I'll put it like in color just to just to emphasize that this is a kind of like a, a phrase. Like it just refers to like a vector that you produce out of F. It will be a vector that you cook up out of F. A vector you you make from F. And if if the curl vanishes, if the curl it is going to be a vector. So if the curl of F is the zero vector, the zero vector, meaning zero comma zero comma zero, um, then F is going to be conservative. Conservative, and you can find a, a potential function. Okay, so what is this thing called the curl? Uh, and again, I kind of will leave the formula not with a, I won't try to give like a big explanation for now of what this formula is. Um, but uh, the curl of F, uh, which is also written in this other way, which by the way is more convenient, so the other way in which it is written is as nabla cross f. Okay. Why is this word convenient? Because okay, this cross kind of refers to cross product. So it reminds you that okay, this whatever this is is going to be related to a cross product. So how did we find a cross product before? Like you would do the determinant thing with a three by three matrix, right? So you would just write. Okay. And then uh, you just then have to think of what could you should put here. So F, like if you remember, 
the rows here would go would be the entries of the vectors, right? So f is a is a force, right? It's a vector, so f just has like three entries. So let's just call like the entries of f um f one, f two, f three. So Okay. And then you see this triangle thing. This is the same triangle that appears like in front of the gradient, right? When you take the gradient of a function. So like this strictly speaking is not a vector per se. It's what you call like a uh, kind of like the vector operator or something like that. But the point of like the gradient is that the gradient was like the partial derivative of a function, right? So kind of like to remember that um, you take you think of this as kind of like the partial derivatives? But of nothing in particular, just kind of like the partial derivatives almost like floating in space on their own. Like, you know, they don't have, they're not attached to anything per se. Uh, and so this looks a bit weird, but uh, like I'll <laughs> compute something for you like right now, which will kind of clarify what this formula means. Like, so, like this formula will be given to you on the exam as well, but you'll see it is less um, confusing than what it seems. So let me just like do it. Let me explain uh, what this is like with some examples because that's a little bit more easy to understand them. So let me do two examples um, of, of what this means, because it's maybe not too clear. What is, what is this? So let's take, for example, f to be, um, let's start with something easy. So I'll take f to be negative y i plus x j plus c k. So this would be the vector negative y comma x comma z. Okay. So that is a vector, that is a force. You can think of it as a force. And so I want to know whether uh, this uh, has a curl, right? What is, or I want to find the curl of this thing. So what do I, what do I mean by the curl of this? So again, like the vector is the second, F is in the second entry of the cross product. So I'll put the entries of F here at the bottom of the matrix. And then in the, in the middle row, like you put the entries of this thing, which you'll just think about putting like some partial derivatives here. So again, like this looks, this looks a bit weird, but you'll see in a moment that it's not as bad as it seems. So let me actually to do it a bit more. Interesting. Oh, let's just leave it like that for now. Bless you. So, so how would you have done this? Like just pretending that this is not like something odd. So if you remember like the formula of the determinant, like you delete the first row, the first column, right? And you would find the determinant of this two by two matrix, right? So it the thing is that it all boils down to thinking what would the determinant of these two things of this thing mean, right? So if you remember the determinant, you have to multiply along the diagonal, right? So you have to multiply this times this. What is that going to mean? That's going to mean take the partial derivative of z with respect to y. 
So like the multiplication here just means take partial derivative. So let me write it like this, like with, because if you think about it, like almost in a way symbolically, it does look like a product, you know, more or less. Like if you knew nothing about what you're doing, you know, like from like language perspective, it just looks like multiplying them because like, that's how you multiply things like symbolically, you just write one next to the other. Uh, and then like, what does this and this mean? It, it will mean the partial derivative of x with respect to d. And that was multiplied by the vector i, right? If you remember like how the determinant goes. Is that making sense kind of? So when I mean multiplication in this context, I just mean take the corresponding partial derivative. That's how you should read this formula. So this is just like a useful device to memorize the formula. Actually, kind of, I think it was heavy side or one like, like, like the way this was rewritten was like after like, you know, electromagnet, like the, I mean, the story of this, like it's more like the, like all of this was developed for like electricity and magnetism more or less. Like, so Maxwell had found these equations, but he didn't use like really vector notation in the way we are used to. So heavy side and like gives other like, people like just rewrote it like in the way we now teach it basically. So uh, it's like a convenient way to, to like memorize this. So, and then like, if you remember like the formula was plus minus like in the alternating signs of the determinant. So there's a minus here with J. Okay, so what goes here, remember it is the determinant of the two by two matrix that I'm showing you. Uh, so this times this means take the partial derivative. Minus this times this, which means again, take the partial derivative. Okay. And then it's plus minus plus. So the last thing will have K. Okay, so. For K, you delete first row, third column. So this times this. Minus this times this, which again, always like in our context means take the corresponding partial derivative. So once you, like, you understand that part, like computing this is just computing a bunch of partial derivatives basically. Is that making sense kind of so far so good? Uh, okay, so that like, uh, um, again, that's kind of like the hard part uh, here. So what 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 are these partial derivatives? The derivative of z with respect to y is zero because you're treating z as a constant with respect to y. Uh, same here. So this one also gives you zero and zero or plus minus minus would have been plus zero, obviously. That doesn't make a difference. But now this one, you do get something more interesting because it's like one, right? The derivative of x with respect to itself is one. And then this one gives you negative one, but there's a minus here, so it becomes plus one, right? So you get zero i, zero j, and two k. So like you just get the vector two k, which is uh, the same as zero, zero, two. So what I'm saying is that the curl like what I'm saying is that the curl of this vector f is the vector zero zero two. Is that making sense? And is this a zero vector? No, it's not the zero vector, right? Like it doesn't vanish identically. The first two entries did vanish, right? But not all of them. So for it to be conservative, we need all the entries to vanish. So since this is not zero zero zero, which is not zero, zero, zero. That allows you to conclude immediately that this vector is not conservative, which means that if you try to find a potential function for this vector, you would wait, be wasting your time. You're never going to be able to solve this problem because it, there is no potential function for this thing. So uh, it's not conservative. Is that making sense so far? So, how are we doing up to now? Yeah. 
So if you look at the final potential function, do we have to check that it's conservative? Uh, so, uh, so it depends. Like, so sometimes, like, uh. Like there are problems that immediately will tell you this vector is conservative, just find a potential function. So that does occur. There are other times where like they just give you like a random vector field, but they ask you to find the work through a curve that is insanely complicated, you know, like something completely crazy. And then you don't want to parameterize the curve. So like if the function, if the vector happened to be conservative, then you would just evaluate the potential and then you would be done. So like, it's kind of like indirectly like telling you, oh, try to check if this is conservative or not. Uh, but, um, so I would just say it's more like 50, 50. So sometimes you're just like directly asked to find the potential, but yeah, you could have like a part, first part that says, why is this conservative? You know, if, uh, so, but it's more, uh, this part is kind of more like for philosophical understanding that, okay, this is actually in the real world, how you would proceed, right? Like you, you just want to check first if something's conservative or not. Do not waste your time trying to find the potential, right? Uh, uh, but let me show you a little bit like of how of how the vectors. Why is this called the curl? Like this is also like useful, uh, something useful to understand. Uh, so before moving on, and then I'll do an example which is conservative, and I'll show you how to find the potential because that's something we do that we want to learn. So, but before doing that. Uh, it's a little bit useful to like understand like uh, what the terminology is. Okay, so here I can um, again enter on GeoGebra a vector field. Um, whose centuries are called P, Q, and R. So uh, P was the first century of this vector, which was negative Y. The vector was negative Y comma X comma Z, if you check your notes. So let me put here uh, negative Y comma X comma Z, okay? So that is how the vector field looks like. Uh, and if you think about it, there's some sort of rotation or spinning, spin, happening, right? Uh, is, that, is that more or less uh, obvious? Like, I don't know, like, I mean, like you can look at it at certain regions where it's more clear than others. So for example, um, if you like, the way to think about this is like, um, like kind of like fluid dynamics. So think about this as giving you like the wind, the speed of the velocity of the wind in space, or or if you just look, or uh, you are like in the ocean. And so you like, you're, you have some water currents on the ocean. And this is like these vectors are giving you the directions of, of those water currents, right? So the idea is like if you put like um, you know, like if you place like a submarine on a or an airplane somewhere in here, and it just being moved entirely through the action of this air, like of these uh, velocity vectors or these water currents or like air currents, then like the ship is going to try to spin or rotate. So like the idea is like the reason why there this is called curl. Is because it's actually related to some sort of like angular momentum. Uh, if you were to place like a small object somewhere in the in inside this aquarium, then like it would try to kind of spin. Like so, uh, conservative vector field is one where like more or less there's no rotation associated to the vector. Okay, so uh, so that's kind of like good point. Uh, it's a little bit easier if you make. Uh, it's a little bit more clear if you make the last entry zero because uh, then it kind of just looks homogeneous along the t direction. And then it's easier to see like there's some spin there. But like, but yeah, this is like, uh, so curl is kind of like related to the fact that, um, you know, there is, there is some spin or rotation that there is, okay. So it's kind of fun to you know enter like those like vectors on GeoGebra, see how they look like. They give you some better intuition of what's happening. Um,
so the idea like something like with an like something like um like, like gravitational field like kind of like the one of the earth like which is like a inverse square law the, those are radio fields right uh then the idea is like if you place like a spaceship or something like that and it's just like a tiny spaceship or a tiny ball they don't try to spin on out of their own under the influence of that field so like uh, because they're conservative basically so mm -hmm. So let me give you one that is conservative and then let's try to find a potential function for it. Um, okay, so I like this example. Here's Okay, let's say that F Okay, let's say that your vector f is that. Well, let's try to find the curl of this vector. So again, like this vector goes in the last row of the matrix. So let's put two x. Z squared to YZ. Partial X, partial Y, partial Z. And again, you kind of do the determinant thing. So it's partial with respect to Y of this thing. Minus partial with respect to Z of this thing. Then minus J, right? So partial with respect to X of two Y Z uh, minus partial with respect to Z of two X plus uh, the last thing has K on it. Um, okay. And so it's partial with respect to x of c squared minus partial with respect to y of 2x. Does that make any sense? How I found like all those terms. Um, so if you do that, what do you get? What is the partial with respect to y of this term? It's 2z. What is the partial with respect to z of z squared? It's 2z. So you get 2z minus 2z. And then this one gives you 0 minus 0. Perfect. And then this one gives you 0 minus 0. So only, like, you know, only the first one was kind of interesting. 
because uh, they, there is a cancellation. All the other terms were kind of zero automatically. And then this gives you zero comma zero. You need all, every single entry to be exactly zero, like on the nose. Like there's nothing else that you have to do to make it zero. Like that's to man manage automatically. So you cannot get anything here besides zero in every single entry. So since this vanishes up completely, like F is conservative. So What does it mean that F is conservative? It means that you can find a potential function. Okay. So there is a potential function for F. So we can find function F Uh, what is the property of the potential that is creating gives you the vector such that and the the gradient of f gives you the vector big f like low upper case so the gradient of the function give the gradient of the potential gives you the force okay But what is the gradient? The gradient is three partial derivatives, right? The gradient is partial derivative of f with respect to x, partial derivative of f with respect to y, partial derivative of f with respect to c. So that must be equal to the force f, right? So you get an equation per entry, right? Uh, so you get what? You get a system of equations, which is that the derivative of f with respect to x must be the first entry of the force, uh, which is 2x. The derivative of f with respect to y must equal the second entry of, of the force, which is z squared. And the derivative of uh, f with respect to z must be um, the third entry of the force, which is 2yz. Is that making sense? Okay, so how do you solve this system of equations? Like here's like the analogy to have in mind. How, here's like an analogy. How, how would you have solved something like this? Well, what you would have done for something like a system like this in top one is integrate both sides, right? You integrate both sides with respect to x. And so you get x cubed plus over three plus c, right? We're going to do exactly the same, but instead of like doing like an integral, like, you know, kind of like we're going to do like an indefinite integral or like an antiderivative with respect to to each of the the variables. So, for example, um, here, like so, once you have the first equation, like oh, let me maybe try it. There are different ways to do this problem, so I'm just gonna show you one method that always works, but it's not the only one. But, so if you have like the, so you can always start with the first equation. You integrate both sides with respect to x, right? So you get x squared, right? Plus a constant of integration. But here's where the, that's, this is like the only place where it is a bit tricky. So you want to put like a constant of integration, right? But uh, if you think about it, we are secretly doing like some sort of like indefinite, like a partial indefinite integral, like an indefinite, like a partial antiderivative because we have to um, remember uh, that this thing is allowed to depend on X, Y, and Z, right? So really this constant, uh, maybe, it's, in fact, let me start with the, Maybe let's, let me start with the third equation because it's a little bit more clear what I'm trying to say there. Like, let's take the, the third equation just to make it more obvious of what's going to happen. So now I would have to integrate this with respect to, to Z, but 
this is kind of like a partial antiderivative, similar to the ones we were finding with double or triple integrals. So you're really pretending that y is like a constant in this context. Like this is better because there are two variables involved. So this is like y squared, sorry, y d squared, right? This has the um, plus a constant, right? But uh, when you took the constant, you had to treat y as a, as a no, what is this constant of integration? When you did this, you pretended y was a constant. And if there had been an x, you would also have pretended that x was constant. So really, this thing is allowed to depend on x and y. Is that making sense? Because it still has a property that is anything of this form still has the property that is partial derivative with respect to z gives you to yz because this has no z dependence so this could just give you zero so uh, when you're trying to find the potential here what you have to keep in mind is that um, the constant of integration is really a function of the remaining variables so that's like the the thing to keep an eye on so like is a function of the remaining variables. Is that making sense? Yeah. So like again, when you add plus a constant, this is like actually the only point in the course where we're really doing like an antiderivative or like, because there are no bounds of integration. So this is why before this had never shown up. But the idea is like uh, when you do like a partial integral, if you want want to think about it that way, uh, you have when your constant refers to everything that you have treated as a constant, and so the variables you're not using are being for the integration are being treated as a constant. So that's why you are allowed to make the constant depend on x on the remaining variables, and th then it's not really like a constant; it's a, it's a function. Okay. So what that tells you is that the function f has to be yz squared plus something else, okay? And and now it's kind of like a system of equations. You can start simplifying it. So you can sub like if f looks like this, then you have two two more equations, which are that the derivative of f with respect to x has to be two x, and the derivative of f with respect to y has to be d squared, right? Because we already used the third equation. There's no, work, no need to think about it anymore. But uh, what happens with these two equations? Well, what's occurring now is that we have an idea of what this f is, right? So what is the derivative of f with respect to x? This doesn't depend on x. So the derivative is just the derivative of c1 with respect to x. And what is the derivative of f with respect to y? f looks now like this. So the derivative of f with respect to y is like um, z squared plus the derivative of c1. Is that making sense? So like I basically, like I had two remaining equations and I just computed the derivative. I kind of computed the left-hand side for like what the function is supposed to be like. So the function is supposed to be this. So I just computed those derivatives for this expression of the function. Uh, so the thing is like f is now this, right? So what, like for example, the first equation for was an equation for the derivative with respect to x, but what is the derivative with respect to x of this function, right? Like this, like doesn't like you know. Right, there's no like this has no partial derivative with respect to x, or like if you want, you can write it as the sum. Okay. 
It's just that the first one is zero. Is, is, is that making sense? Yeah. And so like this, that's why, uh, sorry, this is zero plus the derivative of C1 with respect to X. But if you do it for like the one with respect to Y, right? if, if, if you do this for the one with respect to Y, And then there is something here, right? Like, which is the squared. And that's why I put it as the squared here. Is, is that okay? Uh, cool. So now you have these two equations. Now you have those two equations. And then like, again, to solve for them, you can start with, with whichever you prefer. Like. So let's just take the first one because it looks like more interesting. So now, now let's take okay. Well, integrating both sides with respect to x, what do you find? You find that c1 is the integral of 2x dx. So that's x squared plus c2, okay? But again, this constant of integration is not a constant in the usual sense of the word. It's just like a constant in the sense like every every variable that you treat it as a constant can go here, right? So for example, uh, when we did this, right? Like if there had been a y, we, we would have treated that as a constant, so you would put that. And if there had been a C, you would also have treated as a constant, so you put that. The difference is that now you already know that C1 only depends on X and Y, right? So there's really no need to put the Z dependence. Like that already got was taken care of at the beginning. So essentially, what you, just say, what you can just say that this is like a function of Y exclusively, because um, like maybe just to emphasize this, this function, was supposed to depend only on two variables. So only one variable, only the remaining variable, which is y, could have been treated as a constant. So that's why that's like the constant now depends on y. So the idea is that, you know, uh, the way this works is that every single time the, the before we started with something that could depend on two variables, and now we have something that can only depend on one variable, and then the last step, there won't be any more dependence and there will be like a genuine constant. Is that making sense? Okay, and then when, okay, so this is how C1 looks like. Okay, this is what C1 looks like. And so what is that? What is the only question we haven't used? We haven't used this equation. So uh, now go to Well, the z squares cancel, so you get that the derivative of c1 with respect to y has to be zero. But what is the derivative of c1 with respect to y? This doesn't contribute anything, so you just get that the derivative of c2 with respect to y is zero. So uh, that means that C2 has to be a constant because like it's a function of one variable and the derivative is always zero. So C2 Y is constant. <laughs> so what does that tell you? It tells you what? It gives you the answer for F because F was Y Z squared plus C1, but C1 is X squared plus C2, and C2 is just like a constant. So F of X, Y, Z is Y Z squared plus X squared plus a constant. And so this is like the general formula for the potential, which, um, by the way, it tells you that, you know, 
it's something also that you can like you're told in different contexts like really there's a, a, a force that meets several potentials but they all differ by a constant so this is like you know really like the important part of the potential is this and everything else is kind of like uh, arbitrary redefinition of where you want to set the potential equal to zero basically uh, so if you take the gradient of this function it's easy to check that the gradient of this function is 2x um z squared to yz, which is precisely uh, the vector f that I wrote at the beginning of the problem. So basically, you know, the way to solve these potential problems, to find a potential, what you do is like integrate every single equation. Uh, you know, first, like you integrate first with respect to your favorite variable. So like I integrated first with respect to z, then I integrated with respect to f, and then integrated with respect to y. Uh, but you could also have done that in a different form. Is that okay? Any other questions or comments? Okay, so that is what I needed to tell you about the fun potential. So what I'll do next time is tell you Green's theorem. Green's theorem tells you what happens in a non-conservative case. So in the non-conservative case, when there's a, when the curve is closed, the work is not necessarily zero. And in fact, um, if the curve happens to be on the expert plane, it is a double integral of something. The sum, that something will actually end up being the third component of the curve but I'll tell you that uh, next time. So let's just finish here for now. And next uh, Monday, I'll tell you all about that. Oh.